Hey, John here. Let's look and see how we can write our own programs that we can run on CPM, most notably on a Z80 retro board. This conversation concerns the materials that are available on the GitHub repo for the software for the 2063 Z80 retro board, which is right here. See the description below this video on YouTube for links to this GitHub repo. <laughs> or pause it and just go here. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So in here we have uh, a number of things like where to download all the parts. In here you'll find links to the alteration guide as well as the interface guide. Most of this conversation will be dealing with the interface guide and what's found in there. We've already taken a very detailed look at the alteration guide. You remember the alteration guide is the set of all the rules and what you need to implement all the functions that should occur in your BIOS. Where that's relevant here is in section 9 here on page 23 where they discuss the reserved locations in page 0. Specifically, the fact that there's a jump instruction at address 0 that is hard-coded to branch into your BIOS to do a warm reboot, okay? Then at address 5 is another hard-coded jump instruction that will branch into the BDOS, or what they oftentimes refer to as the FDOS. The FDOS is the combination of both of the BDOS and the BIOS combined. Okay, so this is the main uh, entry point for every one of the functions that we're going to talk about that are defined in the interface guide. Okay, now there's some other stuff going on in the low memory that apply to the more advanced uh, uh, interface uh, functions like. Uh, <laughs> how to do disk IO and what a file name looks like and how to open a file and read and write and all that other fun stuff. We'll talk about that at some other time. Bottom line though is we've seen all this before when we talked about our, uh, our warm bootloader because that's where you have the code that initializes all these values. So the interface guide. Now the first two or three pages include this uh, description of the calling conventions and how do you enter into the BDOS? How do I call the operating system in order to use facilities in there? Today we're going to look at the console I/O routines. How do you read from the keyboard? How do you print on the terminal? That sort of thing. And once you get the hang of that, all the other ones are, are fairly straightforward. Uh, there's some complexities involved in in reading and writing from files on the disk. But once you get the general theme of things, you can run quite a ways on your own. And they give you examples of more complex types of programs, like how do I copy a file? Right? Because if you think about it, what you're doing, you got to open two files. One of them you're going to create. And another one you're going to read, then you're going to read from the one, you're going to write into the other one, and so on, okay? So this gives you some nice uh, complicated sample programs. But what if you don't know anything about anything? Uh, that's what I'm going to try and address right now. These are the basic uh, hello world type programs here. We're going to just read and write for the console and see if we can get that to work, okay? So if we scroll down a little bit, the introduction gives you a nice high-level overview in here. Uh, the short of it is... Uh, what they're doing here is they're presenting this diagram here, and they make a reference back to the alteration guide that we just looked at that discusses what goes down in here, which we just looked at, okay? This guide is really about programs that exist in this TPA, the transient program area, these so-called dot .com files these commands that you create, a program that you write yourself that you can then install on your disk and execute when you're uh, running CPM. Now, when these programs run, there are standard ways by using that jump instruction at address 5 down here in the low zero page that will uh, provide services provided up here by the BDOS and that in turn uses subroutines in your BIOS. Obviously, if you're going to read and write to the console, then you, it's going to ultimately end up in your BIOS routines that you wrote, that we wrote, uh, in order to make our BIOS <laughs> function for uh, provide the services that CPM itself needs, okay? So it's going to wrap them up at a higher level set of functions that are described in here so that the TPA can call them in kind of a standardized, unified sort of way. One of the things that this guide also points out in here is that now they refer to this 
address called boot and T base and C base. If you look at this diagram in here, and we've seen these before when we looked at the memory map for the Z80 retro board, right? T base is 100, boot is zero. C base is, well, that's where the designer of your BIOS decides it's gonna go. You want it as high in memory as it can go in order to maximize the size of the TPA so you can run as big a program as possible, okay? But it has to be pushed down if you put too much code in your BIOS. So it's a give and take sort of a thing. You know, more complicated and fancy BIOS needs more memory, needs more code. Well, that consumes more memory, so you can't run as big a fancy program down here, right? And remember, you only have 64K. So this is like you really need to concern every last byte uh, quite often when you're really, uh, you know, trying to make uh, the most flexible available system. Now, it also talks about the fact that boot is usually zero, and that the TPA is usually 100, okay? And by usually, they mean almost always, okay? As far as I know, the only reason and the only time when these are not actually, when boot is not really at zero, and it gets pushed up, and, and therefore T-base goes up with it, is when you're trying to run CPM on something like a TRS-80. And the reason that is the case is because the TRS-80 has ROMs down here at address zero. You can't put them down there, that's why. So they have special releases of CPM where it can execute and uh, with boot and T-base at, you know, I don't know, like 16K or something in order to deal with that kind of a machine, okay? But it's very rare that you run into that uh, in this day and age. <laughs> all, all the uh, Everything that came before the TRS-80 ran this down here at zero. And uh, it's like I said, as far as I know, the TRS-80 is the only one that did this. There's probably some more out there. Let me know in the comments below. I'd like to see what other esoteric weirdness is out there. Uh, it's all just cool and interesting to see what <laughs> twisted things people come up with. All right. But anyway, so for, for our purposes, boot is zero. T-Base is 100. And almost all bore, all S-100 systems out there, that was the case. You'd be hard pressed to find one other than the TRS-80 that doesn't work that way, and I I suspect that that's true. So the uh, manual here then goes on to talk about, you know, it, it's trying to be versatile, so it's going to give you kind of like you know here's the most complicated thing you'd ever have to deal with, right here on page two, and thank you very much, but that's good for a second or third reading. So we don't really have to worry about what it means to run a program or execute a command that has uh, files as arguments, like the copy example program that they're going to give you in this manual. We're going to just print stuff on the console and read the keyboard. So we're not going to have arguments to our, our command parameters and stuff like that, okay? Now, it turns out that if you do need to uh, write a command like copy or just say, here, dump this out in hex, please, you need to give it a name of a file. And it turns out that you know, parsing this and making what's called an FCB out of it that's formatted so that you can pass it to the the BDOS using calls in the interface guide here. It turns out that's a little bit of work. And because the CPM has to do it on its own for even the ability to, to do a DIR command, at least the directory, uh, it, it has all those routines built in already. So there's some helper routines in there is, is the point here, okay? And we'll see that if you get to the uh, point where you're playing around with the copy example or the, um, the hex dump and stuff like that. All right. So in this paragraph here, they talk about whenever you want to invoke a service from the operating system, you call boot plus five, which is just simply five, all right? And that address it will be a single jump instruction that goes to where the f base begins why because you and i put it there when we wrote the bios that's why okay that's how it gets there uh it points out that the uh, value of f base the address of f base is really useful to know because as i mentioned earlier on my channel that because memory is so limited, it's very common to throw away the CCP while your program is running. And if 
you want to do that. Why, right? You want to use as much memory as possible. So how do you find where the FDOS is? How do you figure out where this region is if every installation of CPM is different? And for crying out loud, the, the TPA could actually be in a different spot and so on. Right. Well, you actually know where the TPA is because the program actually has to be assembled in order to fit the other style machine. OK, which is why it's not too common, because none of those programs are compatible with the standard ones, which means that they're all assembled, compiled or built or whatever you want, word you want to use to start and knowingly start at address 100. OK, so how do you find this? Well, it turns out that the jump instruction that's down here at address five in the zero page is a, a jump, C3 is the opcode, to an address which is exactly equal to the label here, F base. Okay, and again, each system is going to be different depending on how big the BIOS is and moves this up and down. Okay, but that tells you where this line is here, which is really handy because you can come right out of the gate and just say, okay, start my stack right there and work its way down. Give me as much memory as possible and still have the BDOS and the BIOS in memory so that I can call the standard CPM uh, services that are defined in this manual by calling address 5, right? Because they don't use the uh, console command processor. That's why. Uh, you can also, if you wanted to, blow away the entire BDOS and even the BIOS once you've started your program going down here. If you want to do that, though, you have to be very aware of what this, what your particular machine does and how it works, because you might have interrupt handlers up there that you've destroyed. It's really easy to crash a machine if you start deleting the operating system code while it's running, okay? My point is, if you know the machine and you know you're not going to, you know, pull the rug out from underneath like an interrupt handler or something like that, you're free to overwrite the BIOS. You're certainly free to overwrite the BDOS because that's not going to be used in any interrupt handlers. But you could also, my point is, overwrite the BIOS if you want. You have special utility programs sometimes do that on uh, CPM systems. Now, why would you overwrite the BDOS if that's where all the system stuff is? Well, uh, some utility programs might want to use the BIOS but could care less about CPM. And maybe they need the memory, right, because all these hog memory up here. You're free to overwrite them. And still, when you're done, branch to zero down here, which is going to then have a jump that jumps up into the BIOS, provided that you didn't overwrite the BIOS, and uh, at which point it will perform a full warm boot, which would reread the CPCP and the BDOS. We went over all that when we were talking about the BIOS, the warm boot, and all that fun stuff. All right, so that's the general idea. Now, these can overlay each other. That, that's the whole point here, right? So hopefully we've got, you know, some decent situational awareness now. We know where everything is, and because uh, you're going to see references in here about you know what happens if you overwrite the CCP, like right here, uh, assuming that the CCP is being overlaid by a transient program and stuff like that. All right, just get terminology down before we dive in here. Okay, all right. So what does it say about this stuff next? If you type in a command at the uh, at on the CPM prompt, right, like dear or something like that, or type. Those are what we call built-in functions. In other words, the CCP itself executes this function in its own code. It doesn't need any help. It doesn't cause code to be read in from the disk to be executed to provide the operations for dir or type or whatever the built-in commands are. That's what they mean built-in. They're part of the CPM. A transient command on the other hand, is something that has to be read in off the disk. So whenever you type anything in at the console that it doesn't recognize as a built-in, what happens is it will go look for whatever the command is that you typed, whether you got arguments out here or not. It'll take the first word on that command line as the name of the command, okay? It'll add a dot .com to the end of it. Then it'll go out and look on the disk and see, is there something a file out there that is the command word you use, like I'm going to type test1.com, for example, might be my executable. So if I type in test1, I hit enter to look for test1.com. If it's found, it will go and read every byte of this file without any regard to what's in that file. 
copy them into the beginning of the TPA for as much memory as it needs to uh, to hold, you know, to read that whole file into the RAM, and then it will call address 100. And by that I mean there is a stack, and that's discussed in here on page uh, 4. Where am I? Here's 3. This is page 4. This paragraph right here. So it discusses this a little bit and says, look, when you're, TPA when the when the program in the TPA your your program wakes up it is called as a subroutine and the stack pointer will be set to the top of an eight level stack area not a lot okay and the first thing in the stack will be a return address to the CCP uh, which leaves you with seven that you can use on your own right before you overflow the stack so be careful if you're going to just Use the stack that's in there. Now, what does he do here? He says, this is an example, a simple program. We're going to write one just like this. Uh, it says, begin, uh, assemble this program so that when it runs, it will be loaded at 100, uh, which has to do, if you don't realize this yet, uh, when I say something like jump, if not zero, to next C, it needs to know the address of where this is going to be when this program runs, right? Well. Next C is, uh, it turns out in this particular program, is the first instruction in the whole program. And therefore, I can tell you, because it says org 100, this has to be at address 100. Okay? All the other labels that could exist in a more complicated program all have to be placed in memory relative to wherever the thing begins. So you have to tell the assembler to make sure that this label or more accurately, the instructions that consume memory and that the assembler puts into memory as it you know decides, oh, move immediate C comma con in. This is going to require two bytes. It'll have an opcode, and then it'll have a one byte value right after the opcode to hold the con in value, which is an equate to a one. So in 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 hex, you'll see whatever the opcode is followed by an 01 in hex. That's two bytes. So the address of this uh, call routine, which is going to be C3, is the opcode for a call, would then be at address 2. It was the address, or 102, I should say. 100 is the uh, is the opcode for move immediate. 101 will hold the con in byte value here. 102 would have the call instruction opcode, which is your C3. And then the, the BDOS value, which he's equated to 5, would go after that, consuming up 3 bytes total, and so on as this thing goes. So these labels all have to be moved around and accordingly based on the number of bytes consumed by all these instructions that you put in your program. And wherever you say, Start with the first label representing the address given over here, okay? So every .com file, uh, the source code of every .com file in CPM will have an org 100 in normal circumstances, you know, right? unless you're running on a, on a TRS-80 or something like that, where the base of the, the TPA is in a weird spot, okay? All right, so how then do we do this on the retro board, okay? Well, I'm in this path right here. So I, this is my uh, copy of the, of the uh, retro board software from GitHub. The subdirectory, file system, and then progs in there, and examples. So this is going to be three example programs right here. I have a readme file right here that is a little bit of a reference to what page numbers that these comments come. This is essentially the little introductory discussion I gave you summarized here in this nice little readme file. So if you need to go back and refer to that. Okay, so let's look at the first file here. It's basically going to be the one that they give you. Actually, this one's an endless loop. There's goes until you hit an asterisk or something like that. So what's up with all this stuff? Well, it's easier to read your code when you have a label like call BDOS. What am I doing? I'm going to go and invoke a service in the in the BDOS, what service am I going to invoke? I'm going to invoke the console input routine, and so on. So before I uh, use these values, I mean you could just as easily say load C comma one right here. But the problem with that, of course, is you don't really know if the person that put that one in there meant to put a one in because he's going to use it as a counter, or is he going to use the one 
because that represents the console input routine and the BDOS. I mean, what what's up with all that, right? So normally we put names in here to, to make sure that the people understands the intent as well as the value, okay? Not just the value, but the intent. Okay, in the five here is the address where the jump is that goes to the BDOS. Okay, so bird's eye view, assuming for a minute that I did this right, I've got an endless loop here that says what? Go uh, and invoke the console input routine. We'll look and see how that's defined in a minute. How did I know to do that, right? When I'm done with that, my comment over here reminds me <laughs> that the value, I'm going to read one character. It's a blocking read, so it'll disappear and wait forever in this subroutine until a character arrives on the console serial port. When that happens, it will put that one byte value into the accumulator, the A register, and return from that subroutine. When I get back, I'm going to put what? The A, the accumulator value into the E register. I'm going to put con out this time into the C register. You can see that's defined here as a two instead of the one, which was what the con one was up there. Then I'm again, I'm going to call the BDOS, and my comment over here is to remind me that what I'm doing is, again, a blocking write. If the UART is currently sending a character, it'll wait until it's done. Then, when it's ready to go, it will put the, the, the character that I'm asking it to send to the console into the UART, and uh, then it will return from this call down here. And when we look at how these are defined, it turns out when you say, I want to print something on the console, you have to put the byte that you want to send to the console in the E register. Okay, so this is the calling conventions for these two operations. When I come back from that, I'm going to go back to this loop, and I'm in an endless loop, okay? All right, so back to the interface guide. Uh, it turns out that they have a table of all these routines that are provided starting with system reset, which is really yet another way to do a, uh, a warm boot, okay? So, service number one, console input. That's why I had to put a one in the C register, by the way, right? Service uh, number two is console output. Again, that's what the number that goes in the C register. Up to all 36 of these things, a make file, rename file, uh, specialized uh, console IO. You can use this uh, function number six over here, if you want to be able to, to um, interact with the console without waiting, this is great for games. You know, if you have uh, a key that means move left, another key that means moon right, but you want to keep updating the screen and playing the game without waiting for the keys, you might use routines in here, for example. How do I use my paper tape reader and my punch? How do you print stuff on the printer? And so on, okay? So there's a special function for each one of these things. What happens is you never directly call into the BIOS. We did all that work, and we maintained all those rules so that the BDOS knows how to use the functions in the BIOS, and that any CPM program anywhere can put, you know, four into the C register, just like we are putting one and two into the C register, and then call to address 5 without any regard to where the BIOS is or anything else. And it will miraculously be so that whatever operation is requested will take place. And that program doesn't need to know how, where, or how, you know, anything about how it happens. It doesn't care. That's what made these programs all so portable. That even today, I can just go out and grab a copy of WordStar and it'll work on my retro board because they wrote their program correctly to use these 36 functions and nothing more. So uh, there's a little program that we were looking at a minute ago, and then they talk about some conventions and things like that. And then they get into the more complicated stuff like dealing with files and things like that. And eventually you get down here into this section where they say, okay, so for each function, it should have its own heading. I'm surprised they just dive into it out of nowhere. Um, for each function, there's a big block like this that says, here's the name of the function for number zero. What are you supposed to do in order to make this happen? Like put zero into the C register. And then the implied thing, every single one of these is, you put a zero into the C register. Down here, you put a one into the C register. You put the character that you want to, uh, well, this is the return value. Uh, so this is for inputting. You put a one in the C register, and then you call the BDOS. 
the calling of the BDOS is the, um, the implied thing for every one of these functions. You do what it says for the entry, then you call to address five, which is the entry to the BDOS, right? Then they got a little description down here. System reset function returns control of CPM operating system at CCP level. This thing reinitializes the disk subsystem by selecting a log in disk drive A. This function has exactly the same effect of jumping to location boot, which to me means why bother, I guess. Maybe you can use that if you uh, mess around with the zero page in low memory and you have clobbered the jump instruction that is at a location zero. Okay. I don't know. I just jump to zero if I want to do that. I never use this in my programs, but you know, depends on your situation. So let's look at the console input because we use this. How did I know to do this? Why? Because it said so. Put a one in the C register, call the BDOS. When you're done, the accumulator will have the ASCII character from the console port. And then a little discussion down here. Now, notice that it says, not only does it read the next character and put it in the accumulator, it says that graphic characters, along with carriage return, line feed, backspace, they're all going to be echoed back to the console. Tab characters are expanded in columns of eight characters. So if I had a tab, well, I will see on the console, on the screen, it'll move over eight characters. because the BDOS moved it over eight characters. The terminal didn't do that. Okay. Uh, tab characters are expanded. A check is made for the start, stop, scroll. So if you can control S, it'll stop. Um, if it's, if, if, if there's a lot printing and stuff like that, it'll remember that, um, you, uh, it'll stop any printing from going to the screen. If you control P, this is a toggle that allows what's going to the screen to be copied to the printer, as well as the screen. Uh, these are handy, free features. You don't have to do this in your program. It all just does it for you. That's why you have an operating system, okay? Uh, okay, so what else does it say? FDOS does not return to the calling program until the character has been typed, thus suspending the execution if a character is not ready. I call that a blocking read. Same thing happens for the blocking write. Uh, so we're using functions one and two in our first little example program here, right? What are we doing here? We put a two into the C register and we put the character that we want to print into the E register. And it says, put the E, you know, character E will be sent to the console, similar in function one, tabs will be expanded and checks will be made for start, stop and scroll printer echo and, and, and that sort of thing. Okay. So let's just get this going and uh, see what happens. So we looked at the program. It should all make sense now. I'm using equates to put numbers on here so that it's more readable otherwise. I got an endless loop. There's no way for this thing to end on its own. And uh, let's see what happens. If I compile it up. Now there's three of these on here. So we're just doing, we're, right now we're just looking at test number one. And we throw it on the SD card. I've seen that, uh, I've shown you that a hundred times. We can skip that and get to the point where we boot up. If you really need to be reminded of how the SD card build works and all that stuff, see the playlist for the CPM retro series. There's plenty of time spent on that. So, uh, dear, we just executed a built-in command. Uh, all these com files over here are then commands, right? Like test one. So I just compiled my test one and it turned it into a com file using the make file. I didn't really get too much of a detail on that, but the short of it is uh, this make file. looks exactly like all the other stuff that we've compiled for like the retro CPM uh, kernel itself, the BIOS and all the other stuff that we've been doing. There's no, very little changing in here at all, except for this rule over here that says if I got an ASM file and I need to make it into a .com file, do this. And this stuff over here is exactly the same as everything else that we've done so far. The only reason this is unique in any way, shape, or form that I waste any time even bringing it up again is because now I'm going to create something called a .com file, where before we were creating uh, arbitrary binary images like for the flash bootloader or the CPM when we compile the whole thing and that sort of stuff. So the only real difference is that when you compile or assemble, I should say, an, a .asm file, the output will end in .com. But other stuff down here is the same, the symbolic substitution. 
so that if I wanted to put these in here, use those as macros in my source code to print out nice messages like I talked about and did up here with the firmware, boot ROM, and the CPM image and all that fun stuff. I can take advantage of that in my com files as well. Now, I didn't do that in this first example, but I left the, the make file the same otherwise. So really, that's as simple as it is. You write a program and you uh, assemble it. You make sure that when you when you assemble it, you create a .com file in your output, and you make sure that all the addresses and the memory allocation start at address one hex in hexadecimal 100. So if I run the test one program right now, it will do exactly what it says. It looked around and it asked, is this a built-in? <laughs> no, it's not. Okay, read in uh, a file called test1, because that's what I said, .com. Is there one of those? Yes, there is. It's right here. Read it into memory. Branch to, or shall I say call, address 100, so that if this program ever did a return instruction, it could get back to where it came from. Now, if I hit one single key, like a 1, you'll see it comes up twice. If I then hit a single 2, and a three, and a four, and a five, it prints it twice. Now, why the heck? How do I have a bug in such a simple little program? Well, that's not a bug. That's a feature, right? Remember what the documentation says. Console input. This reads the next console character to the register A. Graphic characters, along with other things, are echoed back to the console. So I wrote a program that also prints it back after. The BDOS echoed it back. So if I hit a tab, there's two tabs went back to the screen, right? So if I actually do this and we count the number of characters over here, there's probably 16 uh, minus 2 because I wasted two of the uh, characters on the dots uh, as the tabs over there. Now, honestly, I don't know if it, it processes a control C at this level. No, it does not. Uh, that Some systems will, some of them won't. So if I hit control C like I just did, I'm hitting it multiple times right now. What this will not do is cause a warm boot to take place. Okay, now that's a feature. It didn't say that it would do that in here. It said it would do these other ones. So that just confirms that, right? So I wrote an endless loop here. There's no way to end this program. My only way out of it is to hit the reset button. All right, so let's look at these other two test programs. So here's test2.asm. Starts out the exact same way. What have we got going on here? Well, remember when our transient program starts running. Our stack only has seven levels that we can use in addition to the one that's already used so that I can return at the end of my program down here. This is what's going to happen. In this program, uh, this is similar to the example program that they gave in the, uh, uh, in the interface guide where I can hit a special character and cause it to stop running, like the period in this case. I think they use the asterisk in there. But I'm also going to create my own stack. All right? Now, the reason you want to create your own stack, I think, should become... It, it should already be obvious. Most programs need more than seven levels of a stack. Now, it turns out you can you can call into the BDOS and mess around with, with the, uh, uh, the console, and you can do a fair number of things, really simple little things with seven levels of stack. But as soon as you do anything real, you need to allocate more stack space. So one standard way, a common way to do that, is to just write in your program, say, define storage, some however much room you need for a stack, and throw a label. In this case, it's at the end of the region, right? Because the stack works from high addresses down to low, where the low addresses are the beginning of your program, and the high addresses are down here at the end of your program, right? So by doing this, I reserve 256 bytes of space that will not really be filled in. It doesn't matter. I'm saying it could be garbage. It'll turn out to be full of zeros due to the way these things work. And I have a label here at the end of it, so I can say, what am I doing here? I'm going to say load HL with zero. I'm going to add SP to HL, and then I'm going to say put my stack in SP. Then I'm going to say push HL. <laughs> What's all this, right? Well, it turns out the stack pointer is kind of a special register, and it 
doesn't have it, it doesn't act like a lot of the other registers do. There's no convenient there's no way for me to just simply copy the stack pointer into another register. Okay, I could store it directly in memory if I really wanted to. That would be one way to save it somewhere if I wanted to, and that's the goal here. Or I could say, look, uh, set HL to zero and then add the stack pointer contents, not something in the stack, but the stack pointer value itself, to the HL register. There is no load HL with the stack pointer value, but I can add it for whatever reason. They felt the need to do that. So, okay, you hardly ever mess with the stack pointer, so it's okay for this to be a little bit inefficient. Uh, it's really not a huge deal. What I've done here is I've allocated a local stack. I've copied the stack pointer into the HL register by using this pair of instructions, hence my documentation over here. Then what am I going to do? I'm going to set the stack pointer equal to the address, my stack. So I'm going to say point the stack pointer over here at the end of the save area. Then I'm going to push the HL register into my uh, own stack area here. So that's how I'm going to save the stack pointer that the uh, caller gave me the, when, when, the, when the CPM started this program running. And I want to do that so I can remember where that tiny little stack is, so I can restore that stack down here, and that's exactly what I'm doing with down here. The opposite of this one is to pop the HL register back out of the stack, which gives me the value I put in up here, okay, which was the original stack pointer. Put it back into the stack pointer, and then I can do a return using the original tiny stack that was given to me, okay? Now inside here is basically the same code as the example in the interface guide. What do I do? Uh, I'm going to make a call to VDOS to read a character from the console. If that character is a period, I am going to go down here and do the code I just talked about. Otherwise, I'm going to put it back in the E. This is the code we just saw before. I'm going to echo it back on the screen, which means it's going to print the uh, second of, uh, they're still going to be doubled like they were before because I'm doubling it as well as the BDOS. So let's run the test two program this time. All right, same kind of a thing is gonna happen over here. Tabs will be expanded. Backspaces should work as well, okay, and so on. Uh, and it's all kind of messed up due to the excessive echoing and so on. And what did I say, if I hit a period, it will uh, restore the stack and return back to the operating system. Okay, and that's exactly what happened when I hit the period. Now notice I didn't have to hit the carriage return or anything else. These are reading one character at a time right as they arrive from the UART. So the instant I hit that period, it returned and it decided to do this and we're back where we came from. So that's how you can create your own uh, stack if you need more than uh, a teeny amount of uh, space that you are given by default. So what happens in this particular one here? Basically the same sort of thing. I set up my stack for my own custom one, which I don't really need, by the way, in these applications because I'm not using that much. But if you write any program that does anything more than some trivial little stack, or rather, <laughs> that does any more than some trivial little uh, uh, interaction with the console, you pretty much need to create your own stack somehow either by creating some space in here or asking, hey, where does the, uh, you know, where does the BDOS start? And I'm going to clobber the CCP and I'm going to just stick the stack pointer to point up in there and work my way down, okay? Now, the body of this one is all in here. What do I do? Uh, I read a character. If it's an asterisk, I call a subroutine to deal with asterisks. If it's a period, I do the do period, which we just saw, and that's going to return to the corner. Caller, I should say, uh, and if it's neither of those two, it'll let go of the character back. So what did I do? I just added this. Uh, and what we see here is I load C with constr. So the point of this one is I added another service. All right, so I got one, two, and this time I, I have nine. This is the, I want to print a whole string. So I don't have to write a whole routine to print a whole string out with a loop and everything else and keep calling con out, con out, con out. I can just say, hey, point the, as you'll see, DE register at some message that I want to print, put constr into C instead of writing my loop, call the BDOS, and I'm on my way there, okay? And then I go back to my would-be otherwise endless loop up here, okay, and to keep going. If not for this little period jobby, it comes down here, restores the stack, gets on his merry way. 
So what is the message I'm going to print out? Well, this says get version. And then here's this little macro type of thing that we've seen before when I did the firmware and the, uh, the retro BIOS, right? And this is the make when the make file will replace this before it assembles this program with whatever this represents. And what that does represent is the version um, tag that looks like this right here that is generated by the Git uh, repo, the version control stuff like that, right? If you don't know what this is, I think I explained it once before, but this is the, uh, the tag number in the repo, the first two digits, as I made this version 1.0, I guess. And then this is 12 commits since that last version tag was created. And this is the uh, thumbprint, the fingerprint, the hash of the Git uh, version number. The fact that it says dirty over here on the right means that I've made modifications into this repo that have not yet been committed. So if I say git status dot, you can see I've created some files and I modified my readme file because I was putting in notes about what page numbers and things like that in the interface guide I was referring to, all right? So I'll push all this stuff up after I'm done recording here. So let's see that one run, okay? So what does test three do? All right, so again, it echoes unless I hit something like an asterisk. And you see it print out my git version uh, tag in there. And after the git version, it probably prints a carriage return in a line feed. Otherwise, it would keep going in a line. And yes, we got a return in a line feed, okay? Notice there's a dollar here. Normally, I put a, a null, a zero at the end of my strings. What's this dollar doing in there? Well, in some form of wisdom, what we have, if you look up what, uh, that's number six. I'm going to be looking at number nine. Number nine. Here we go. Print string. Put a nine in the C and put the string address, the starting address of the string in the DE register. It says print. Uh, the character string one at a time stored in the memory at the DE uh, until it finds a dollar sign. Tabs are expanded as we saw before. And checks are made to start and stop the scroll and the printer echo. That's interesting. Uh, while outputting. Yeah, sure. Of course, you'd want to be able to stop it if it was printing too much too fast. You hit Control X to pause it and hit Control Q to resume it. And the same thing with printing. So if I hit Control P, it would echo all this out to the printer while it was printing it on the screen. Now, uh, this is, uh, remember that in my printer routine, I explained before in the BIOS that it, you have to be careful that if somebody ever hits control P and there's no printer connected to your machine, right? I think this is where the BIOS is, right? BIOS list is the routine I'm talking about. This is why we need to do this. What do we do? We jump to pern out. Oh, this must be in an include file in the library. IO memory. PRN. Printer status. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Okay, so if we type in what? LS. Library, there should be a printer or a listing or something on the CTC IO memory pern. Okay, so in here, what happens is when I'm printing, see, I'm playing around with all these games and I put this note in here that's a sanity protect, sanity check to prevent seizing the entire operating system. This is because if you ever hit control P, and there's no printer plugged in. CPM systems were notorious for permanently seizing up and you're done. You, nothing you can do but hold a cold, hard, hard uh, front button re reset. All right. You had a cool boot, that thing. And it's because people didn't think about what would happen if the printer wasn't hooked up. Let's say IBM PCs had a very similar problem. Try to print something on a PC and in the early days, that thing would just sit there forever as well. And I think I mentioned in my channel before, they used to make a dongle you could plug into your 
PC that just said, there's no printer here, make it look like the printer is always ready and it can print in an infinite rate of speed. So if you ever tried to print, it would sync the characters, throw them away and let you get on with your life. But this thing, if I control P right now, which I just did, I can continue typing. I control P again, and now I'm turning off the printer, so to speak. Uh, and it's because of the logic that we talked about before that does, a, like I said, a sanity check. It says, basically, if the printer is in an error state and it is uh, also out of paper and it's busy and it's acknowledging, if every single one of these is high at the same time, then it turns out that this combination of um, status signals is not actually legal in the Centronics specification. Okay, So in this very specific case, that is never supposed to happen. If every one of these are in fact high, most likely 99.999999% of the time, it's because the printer is not connected to the cable, and therefore I just simply return out of this print routine. And that's why this doesn't seize up right now. So that's 30 episodes ago, perhaps. I don't remember how far back that was, but this is what I was uh, preparing us for. So again, if I hit the period, it goes back to the command prompt. So what we've got here is the ability to create a com file and assemble it and a little bit of sanity checking on what it means to call the operating system and where to look up what you can do. So you can sift through now. This is the interface guide, each one of these boxes, each one of these sections. What does it mean to read the console buffer? This is a whole other way to read characters with input processing and fancy stuff with editing and all kinds of other fun stuff. And what else they got? Console status. This is, hey, is there a character ready? If I call the read routine, am I going to get one or will I have to wait? You can simply ask if that's going to happen. What version of the operating system am I running? And it'll come back with HL equal to whatever. Uh, it tells you it'll be 1 if it's MPM or 0 if it's CPM. L will be zero for everything prior to 2.0. 2.0 will be this and so on. So you can figure out what, what release of the OS you're on. The reason you want to know that, by the way, is because as the uh, CPM versions increase, the numbers increase, what happens is you have more functions that you can call. The, the largest numbered functions are added as the newer versions of CPM come out. So you know not to call them if you're on CPM 1.4, you know, that kind of thing. So you can obviously uh, ask it to reset the disks. I, I want to start uh, looking at files on disk B instead of disk A or whatever. And it tells you what numbers mean, what for uh, different drives, how do you open files, and so on, right? So you can work your way through here to get the more fancy stuff. I'll talk about some of these other ones later on when we write a more sophisticated program. Now, if you think about it, there's no reason that you couldn't create you know, pretty simple games if you wanted to by just reading from the keyboard and printing on the screen. There are a couple of games that are uh, pretty well known, like this particular one, Catch 'em, and there's a game called Ladder. You might recognize uh, what these are sort of based on. Uh, and uh, these are uh, widely available CPM games. These are all COM files, and all they do is read to the keyboard and draw to the screen. So, give it a try! Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.